I want to wish you a Merry Christmas to you and your family from the Bonita Valley family. I hope that you have an amazing day, a fun day, a food day, but most of all, a Jesus day. We want to share with you a very special time that I hope you'll just enter into and experience God's love in a unique way, in a personal way. We're going to share some songs with you. We have some videos. Uh, we're going to share, I got a short message for you about how much we're loved by God. We're going to share communion together and you can actually just push pause and get communion uh, elements there, some bread and some juice and share communion with, with our family of faith. But most of all, again, I hope that on this Christmas day, you experience Jesus. And not just today, but every day. That every day for a believer is Christmas. Every day for a believer, we experience the greatest gift we've ever been given, the gift of Jesus.
came down as an infant No reputation Form of a servant His life would be perfect Laid down for us The only one worthy There's no greater
deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Won't you help me say? Come on, stand to your feet and declare that he's worthy. If you know in your heart, if there's no one like him, and that he's deserving of all that you can give him. Come on, won't you pour your worship on him? Worthy, and you deserve the praise, Jesus. Can we just give him praise one more time for the truth that we just declared? Come on, worthy is his name. He is worthy because no other birth in history brought the hope, peace, joy, and love to the world like Jesus did 2,000 years ago on that starry night in Bethlehem. He is worthy because his name is a name that is above every name. And I want to invite you right now in this moment to just welcome him in all of his goodness and his glory and his majesty in this place here today as we pray. So Jesus, we just welcome you. Jesus, you are worthy. You're so worthy of our praise. 
And we just welcome you in this house here today. We just lift up that name that's above every name. And we just pray that as, as you move among us here today, God, we're so thankful for the worship. We're, we're so thankful for the word that Pastor Jeff is going to deliver. We're so thankful for you. And we just welcome you in all of your goodness, majesty, in your presence. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And one more time, just lift up to the Lord a big amen out there, which simply means I agree. Once again, I want to just welcome you to Christmas at Bonita. It's so great to be able to celebrate tonight with you as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Before you are seated, here's what I want you to do. Now, we're kind of in the virus season right now, so we're not shaking hands or anything like that. But if you would do something for me before you're seated, there are some amazing people right around you. If you'll turn to a few of them and just say, Feliz Navidad, before you're seated. Come on, let's welcome one another before you are seated. If this is your first time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry, Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. And if you are a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of this service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. BCC is going to begin 2023 with a one service celebration. We plan one of the most inspiring and joyful services you've ever experienced. It happens New Year's Day, Sunday at 11 a.m., and you're invited. Bonita Valley has big plans for 2023. Throughout the week, we have life building and connecting opportunities that are geared to build you up and encourage you and your family. On Monday nights, we host a super fun fitness experience called Dance Fit at 6 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. On Tuesday mornings, Prime Timers gathers for a time of connection and fellowship and time in God's Word. On Tuesday evenings, we provide life-building support groups like Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share, and Divorce Care. Wednesday evenings are a night for the whole family. There's Bonita Rangers Club for boys, Bonita Girls Club, Bonita Valley Youth for students in middle and high school, and our weekly Wednesday night service for adults. On Thursdays, our Ministry to Women has two opportunities at 10 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. And our Ministry to Men gather for their Bible study at 6.30 p.m. in the Family Center. On Saturday mornings, there's more fitness opportunities with boot camp for those who want to get in better shape physically and spiritually. Mark your calendar for all these amazing ministries as they begin their launch the second week of January. Calling all middle and high school parents. Bonita Valley Youth is excited to host our next Parents' Night on Sunday, January 8th. It happens from 5 to 6.30 p.m. in the Family Center. Dinner and childcare will be provided. To sign up, just stop by the events tab at bonitavalley.com. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool, and elementary aged children in the Life Center gym. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the follow the service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.
I can feel it in the air. Christmas time is coming. Family and friends have drawn near. Joy to the world as heaven and nature sing. Hearts are filled with happiness and cheer. Oh, grandma's in the kitchen. The aroma fills each room. Children making angels in the snow. And in the midst of silent night, holy night, and everything, there's one thing that I have come to know. The tree, think there might be one for me. Little children everywhere, looking for reindeer in the air. I hear them knocking at the door, just the season for more and more. As we celebrate the birth of our Lord, grandma's in the kitchen, the aroma fills each room. Children making angels in the snow, in the midst of silent night and holy night, in everything. There's one thing that I come to know When I was a boy growing up, uh, I kind of had this idea, and, and the idea was that, that if I wanted to raise my odds of getting the presents that I really, 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 really wanted, anybody ever have, you just, you, you, you dream about it, uh, if, I, if I was going to get those presents, then I needed to be really, really, really good. Now, I didn't get that idea from the Bible, I got that idea from a song. A song that says, Santa Claus is coming to town. How many of you know that song? Okay, how many of you know, three of you? Like, you don't get out or what? So I said, no, no. So, so if you know the song, you're actually going to help me. We're going to sing this together, okay? Uh, you're going to help me with this. And actually, we're both going to sing the song, and it's a tryout for next year's team. So we're actually trying to find out <laughs> who among you has some musical talent. So uh, Edgar, give me a chord, give me a C, chord C, okay? Okay, one more time for them. Okay, we'll put the words up, okay, to get you ready. We're gonna start off, there's the words. You better watch, okay, all right. So we're gonna sing this together. Now that means with your voice. Together means all of us, all right? Because like some of you aren't giving me confidence that you really got this, okay? So here we go, okay, right, here we go. You better watch out. You better not. Here we go. Now don't tell me she embarrasses you. So, all right, here we go. Making a list. Oh, you need the words, huh? Thanks, Anna. 
is coming to town. All right, here we go. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. Bad or good, so be good for goodness. So you better, you better not. You better not. Um, you look really confident. Santa Claus is coming. There you go. You got it. Two top. All right. Give yourself a hand. Good job. We're going to sign you up for next year. Now, one of the things as I get older and I sing the songs again that I learned when I was a kid, how many of you now, it's, it, the songs are different. Like when I was a kid, I caught San, Mommy Kissing Santa Claus bothered me. <laughs> now, I, now I like it. So, uh, and, and, and this song, this song, looking back now through adult eyes, to be honest with you, is it was motivating, but it's a bit manipulative. You better watch out. He knows when you're asleep and he knows when you're awake. Now, as a kid, as a young boy, I was a literalist. All young children are. That's why with young kids, you can be very careful because they believe what you tell them. You tell them something, they believe it, and, and, and they believe what they see, and they can't think abstractly yet. So everything's like real to them. It's all kind of the same world. And so that song, and looking back, my parents, I think they drilled that song into me again and again and again, and what I got from that song as a literalist was no pouting, no crying, be nice, be good for goodness sake, which as a kid, that meant for good presence sake, and that's how you got what you really, really, really wanted for Christmas. The only problem was sometimes during the year, on occasion, I was more naughty than nice. Now, I know that will surprise many of you because I'm a pastor. It doesn't surprise my wife because I'm still on occasion more naughty than nice. And so, so if that's what you were, you do what I did. If you were sometimes naughtier than you were nice, then it got close to Christmas, you wrote Santa an apology letter and you hoped for the best. And apparently I'm not the only naughty person who's written a I'm sorry letter. Let me show you one from, from, from Sophia. Here's the first one. Dear Santa, when, interesting, when I was, when it was Saturday, I thought I would try to be good the whole winter vacation, but it seems like I did not succeed. Will you still give me a present anyway from Sophia? Now, Sophia actually works in our, she's in the control room. She runs the power, no, it's a different Sophia. It might be, but now it's a different Sophia. But so see, my plan was the whole Christmas vacation, but it, it, it didn't quite work out that way. And Duncan writes what I think is a very sincere, I'm sorry letter. Let me show you Duncan's letter. Dear Santa, I am so sorry for what I did. Do you forgive me? Duncan, and he, he, he did a picture of himself. And he says, there's more on the back. That's where his list is. If you forgive me, turn it over because I got stuff I want. So that's Duncan, and I think he's sincere. And then there comes Mia, who, who, who gives her apology with, with a, a request. Here, here's Mia's letter. My name is Mia, she writes well, and I am trying my best to be good, but I can't because it is too hard. <laughs> Can you give me advice? <laughs> it's, it's like, like, I just need some advice. Like, I wanna be good, but I just need some advice. All right, come on, how many of you can relate to these kids? Now, I don't mean when you were a kid, I mean now. I mean like right now, you can relate to these kids. Because some of you, like, like some of you, you, you know what, you know the naughty nice thing. And, and, and in fact, here, here's my guess. I think some of you here tonight, the only reason you're here for this is because you think showing up for a Christmas Eve service might move you from the naughty side just into the nice side in the nick of time before St. Nick arrives. So maybe this will buy you a few points because I was in church for like how wrong this thing is. And so, so give me a few nice points. All right, if, if that's you, and that is some of you, relax. And here's why you can relax. I got some good news for you. Whether you've been naughty or nice, 
You are on God's Christmas list. Now, that's not my words. That's Jesus' words. Jesus says this in John 3, 16. And I want you to read it out loud. That means with your voices. Like, you got to work with me on this, okay? So put it on the screens, out loud, all together. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16 is a verse that many of us memorized, the first verse we memorized, and a lot of us, we did it for prizes. Others of you have seen it at sporting events, and someone holds up, you've seen the numbers. You don't always know what the verse says. And there's many people who know what the verse says, but they've never experienced what the verse means. And what I want to do for just a couple of moments is, Jesus is actually telling us how to experience how to experience a great, great, great life, how to experience a great, great, great Christmas. And there's three things that you and I have got to know that he tells us in this verse. He's actually talking to a man named Nicodemus, and we get to listen in because what he says to him, he says to us. And the three things that you and I need to know to have a really, really great Christmas and a really, really amazing life, here's the first one. Jesus wants us to know that God is a giver, not a taker. Again, he says, God loved the world so much that he, what? Gave. Now, the reason I say that is because there are many, and you may have heard someone say, why did God take my, fill in the blank, my spouse, my, my child, my friend, my grandparent? Why did he take my job? Why did he take my health? Insurance companies don't help us, like when there's a hurricane or a tornado and, and they can't blame anybody. It's an act of God. Yeah, right. Like anything bad that happens, God did it. And so maybe you, let's get really personal. Maybe from last Christmas to this Christmas, there's somebody that was here last Christmas that's not this Christmas. I'm one of those. My dad passed away in October. Lived a full life, great life. I know where he is. He's experiencing Christmas in the presence of God. So, so he's having an amazing time. But it's different. And some of you, your spouse isn't here. Some of you, a child or a family member isn't here. Some of you are going through a divorce. Or some of you are going through, and you found yourself saying, God, God, why did you take my? And Jesus has a word for you. He has a word for me. And the word is that God is not a taker. That God will never, 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 ever, ever, ever rip you off. Now, there is a taker in the world. Jesus identifies him. In John 10, 10, he says, you have an enemy of your soul, an enemy of your life. And Jesus says of this enemy that he comes to do three things. He comes to steal, he comes to destroy, he comes to, to, to bring death, and, and that enemy, he says, is Satan. You have, you have, there is a taker in this world, but it's not God. Jesus not only says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he then says, but I've come that you might have. I didn't come to take something. I came to give you something. I came that you might have life. That you might have it as full and complete as you can imagine it, because God is not a taker. And Jesus came to show us the heart, the giving heart of God. He literally came to put a face on God. He wrapped himself, he's fully God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Those aren't their names, it's just it's the offices, the, the, the ways they serve. And, and, and he wrapped himself in flesh and he moved into the neighborhood to show us what God was like. And he constantly was saying, here, you don't know what God's, I want to show you what God is really like. And I want to show you, he says, that God is the most lavish, generous giver Ever. God is not a taker, he's a giver. The Genesis story, the creation story, is a giving story. It really is. It begins like this, in the beginning God, and God did what? God created the heavens and the earth and, and the stars and, the, and planet earth and the animals and the fish and the birds. And his ultimate creation was Adam and Eve. Now God created all these things, listen carefully, he created all of them and he says to Adam and Eve, they are presents, they are gifts for you. Enjoy. God didn't need stars. He didn't need the heavens. He didn't need the earth. He didn't need people. God doesn't need anything. So why did he make them? Because they were gifts. And he says to Adam and Eve, and he says to you and me, some of you don't even know enjoys in the Bible, but it is. I give you all these things for your 
enjoyment. Because there's three things you and I need to understand about love and about God's love. Let's put them on the screens. The first one is simply this. Giving is what love does. Love is a verb. It's not a feeling. Now I know I feel love. It's a, a quiver in your liver. But it's more than that. Love does something. Love is an action word. Love gives. Giving is how love expresses itself. How do you express love? You give. Giving is God's love language. I don't know if you're familiar with the love languages and, and what that simply means is there's ways that you and I understand love and speak love and the way God does it is his language of love is loving by giving, by sharing, by creating. Now what's so important for us once again to understand is that our God is not a taker, our God is a continuous giver. The apostle James writes, James 1 verse 17, every good gift and every perfect present comes from where? Heaven. It comes down from whom? Okay, now you're a little weak on this. Like this is our participation part, all right? Every good gift comes from where? And it comes from whom? Because you've never received a gift. See, every gift is a reflection of the giver. And the only reason, listen, the only reason you and I can ever give anything good is because God gave it to us. You didn't create anything good. God created the good. And, 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 and so every good gift, and I'll, I'll be in hospitals and I pray for people, and I'll thank them for the hospital. I thank God for the nurses and doctors. I thank them for all their giftings. But every good gift, it came from him. Because God is not a taker. God is a giver. And what God does, so interestingly, with his giving of Jesus and he's, he's like a parent who's so excited to give this gift, and, and so he gives these hints. He just drops hints for, for generation and generation and gen, little hints that Jesus is coming, that Jesus is coming, because he can't wait to tell us. And then he gives us Jesus. He's kind of like the last of the amazing things that God did. And, and, and how many of you, like, I don't, many of you will celebrate Christmas tonight, like if I'll let you out of here. You'll celebrate Christmas tonight. Some of you, it'll be in the morning. And parents, how many of you parents, like the best present, you, you put that one aside. You want that one to be last. Or even when they're open, don't open that one yet because you want that one last. And sometimes to make sure the biggest, best present is last, you hide it so they can't get to it. Uh, a dad was talking about his daughter wanted a bicycle and they were all Christmas day and, and she didn't see her bicycle. And he says, what's that hanging in the chimney? And, and there was a note it was hanging and so she looked and says what does it say and, and it says I couldn't get your bike down the chimney it's on the roof and Santa and she runs outside and the dad had, had chained it to the chimney okay let, let, that was not me and there's no way I'm but anyway I'm just saying because the best gift was given last and God God gives Jesus the greatest gift and, and he gives it to us like last and, and here's why so that our heart breaks, so that our pains, so that our failures, so that our guilt, so that our loneliness, even so death, will not have the final word in our story. I'm telling you again, some of you are experiencing this Christmas in a way you've not experienced any other Christmas. And it's so easy once again to try to find God, why did you take? And God wants you to know something. He makes a promise. Paul writes that God promises this. God promises to work all things together for good. That means every single thing. He synergizes it together to good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And every one of us is called to the purposes of God. And Paul says there is nothing that happens in your life that God is not working together. So listen to me. If it's not good yet, God isn't finished working. If you go, but this isn't good, he's not finished. But I'm still alone, he's not finished. But I'm still hurting, he's not finished. God doesn't waste anything. He synergizes everything. Because God is not a taker. Jesus said, God so loved that he gave. God is a giver. So that's the first thing you and I need to know to have a, a great, great Christmas, a great, great life. And here's the second. Jesus secondly says, God doesn't write us off, God writes us in. 
He never writes us off, he writes us in. John 3, 16 again, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that, say it out loud, everyone. God so loved the what? The world so that how, who? Everyone, not certain people, certain classes of people. True story. When we all arrived early in the band and the singers, like several of them, I don't know if you noticed, but they all had the same shirts. And I told the other guys in the back, I said, apparently we're not in the group text. Because no one told me it's a red and black checkered church. And it kind of told us like they're in and we're not. They're the cool people. And we're like, the, we're, we're not. And so that, that kind of happens for all of us at times that some are in and some are out, that some are included and some are not. And Jesus says, I want you to know that God doesn't write anyone off. People sometimes do. We sometimes write ourselves off. In fact, some of us have said no to ourselves when we ask anybody else. Don't, don't tell yourself no before you give somebody else a chance to say no. We write, I can't do that. I don't even try to do that. But God is all about writing us in. I'll show you from Scripture. Matthew 1, verse 1. The family tree of Jesus Christ, David's son, Abraham's son. Matthew begins his gospel in what seems like a pretty like uninteresting way, he starts it off with a genealogy or a family tree. He starts it off like a phone book. Like most of us today, you gotta be a certain age to even know what that is. But, but he starts off with these names. And, and come on, let's get real. I don't know how many of you tried to read the Bible through, and as a pastor, I read the Bible through every year. I read it all the way through in, the, in, in a year. And if you come to one of those genealogies, when you come to a family tree, how, first of all, we often skip it because how many of you can't read the names? Like I just, I'm a pastor, I go hard name, hard name, hard name, and I keep moving. Because who can say those names? Who knows how they were said? And in fact, even when I read it to you, you think I know, I just say it with confidence. I have no clue how you say those names. You know, I often Google up, how do you say? And there's like five pronunciations. They don't know either. Nope. If Google doesn't know, nobody knows. So they're hard names. Family trees. So, so why, why even bother reading them? Aram had Aminadab. Aminadab had Nashan. Nashan had Ralphie. I know that's a different Christmas story. But, but, but there's all these names. Matthew starts that way, first of all, because he's writing to a Jewish audience, and the family tree, the genealogy, is so significant for your tribe, your, your job, your spouse, your connection to the Messiah. But it's even for those of us who are not Jewish and you're not into a Jewish family tree. And here's what Run Writer tells us. Listen. Most families keep their family secrets a secret. Most don't talk about the swindling uncle or the street-walking great aunt. Such stories remain unmentioned at the family reunion and unrecorded in the family records. That is, unless you are the God-man. Jesus displays the bad apples of his family tree in the first chapter of the New Testament. You barely, you barely dip a toe into Matthew's gospel when you realize that Jesus hails from the tilted Halo society. Rahab was a Jewish, a Jericho harlot. Grandpa Jacob was a slippery enough character to warn an ankle monitor. David had a personality as irregular as a Picasso painting. One day writing psalms, another day seducing his captain's wife. But did Jesus erase his name from the list? Not at all. You think he would have. The gossip from Matthew's genealogy would give TMZ a year's worth of TV programs. So why did Jesus hang his family's dirty laundry on the neighborhood clothesline? Because some of us have an uncle with a prison record, a dad who never came home, a grandparent who ran away with a co-worker. If your family tree has some bruised fruits, or, or maybe you are the bruised fruit, Jesus wants you to know there's room for you in his family tree. Not only is there room for you, he lists all these names, and every name is a story. There's not a perfect person in the list until you get to Jesus. They were all goof-ups and failures on multiple levels until you get to Jesus. And one of the things that you find is that not only does God write us in, 
He's not embarrassed by us. Now, okay, like when I held the mic down, like you looked a little embarrassed about, oh, just saying. Sometimes like people, family members embarrass us and like you put them in the back of the picture. God never does that with us. Let me show you from the Bible. Watch this. It says in Hebrews 2, verse 11, Jesus, who makes people holy, isn't what? A shame to call them, to call us brothers and sisters. Listen, God not only writes you in, he's never ashamed of you. There are no second-class family members in God's first-class family. Are we perfect? There isn't a perfect one among us, but we are included. So the second thing you've got to know to have a great, great Christmas and a great, great life is that God writes us in. He doesn't write us off. And one more. In John 3, 16, Jesus also says you've got to know this. To have a great Christmas and an amazing life. He says, believe in the God who believes in you. Again, John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. So that everyone who, what? Believes in whom? In him. Not ourselves. In him. Will not perish, but have eternal life. Now this word beliefs, listen again. We sometimes... We have to define our terms, and belief doesn't just mean mental assent. In fact, James says something interesting. James says, you believe in God? Good, so do the devils. Demons believe in God. In fact, demons believe more in God than most of us do, because they know there's a God, and they tremble at his name. They know there's a God, but they, don't, they believe there's a God, but they don't believe in God. There's a difference between believing there is a God and believing in God, and believing in God means that you and I Trust in, rely on, depend upon, we follow wholeheartedly. That's the rub for some of us, honestly. When it comes to believing, to simply believing, it just seems too simple. And see if you can identify with any of these statements that I've heard and some that you and I have said. Well, we'll put them on the screens. I'll fix myself, thank you. I'll overcome my failures with hard work. I'll alleviate my guilt by staying busy. I'll be so busy I don't think about what I regret. I'll achieve the salvation or completion I need the old-fashioned way by earning it. The truth is, if you and I could do any of these things, if you and I could fix ourselves, overcome our failures, alleviate our guilt, achieve salvation by earning it, God wouldn't have needed to give Jesus but you can't, and I can't. And even though at times we don't admit we can't, God knows we can't, so before we even understood that we can't, he gave us the greatest gift that we need. Max Lucado puts it like this, he writes, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a savior. God gave you and me the ultimate gift to meet our ultimate needs. And I want you to know something about, we've all stumbled, we've all made mistakes, we've all had failures in our life. But no matter what you have done or where you may have gone, God still believes in you. There's never been anyone who believes in you more than the God who made you. Before he made you, he saw you. The word says he wrote a brag book about you before you lived one day. There's no one who believes in your potential. There's no one who believes in your purpose. There's no one who believes in your future like the God who gave you purpose, potential, and a future. So here's the question. The question is not, does God believe in you? The question is, do you believe in him? 
And Jesus says, God loved the world so much that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal, everlasting, over-the-top life. That, listen, how you get the really, 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 really great presence, the really, really, really great life is first of all understanding that God is a giver, not a taker. That God didn't take your loved one, and he didn't take your job, and he didn't take your health, and he didn't take your hopes and dreams, because God will never rip you off. Have we lost those things? Yeah, many times, but God didn't take them. He came to give us. He came to, he came to write a new story. To help. He's still working on us because he works everything together for good, because God is a giver, not a taker. Jesus said, you got to understand that God wants to write you in. He doesn't want to write you off. Others may roll their eyes. God never rolls his eyes at you. God never goes, there they go again. No, he cheers us on. If you're still breathing, you can still be. You can still do what God dreamed up for you before you ever took your first earthly breath. And it will continue when you take your last earthly breath because God wants you in his family. How do I get there? I gotta believe in the God who believes in me. Believe in the God who believes in you. And I wanna give you three ways because you can do that before you walk out of this room. You can do that online wherever you are, whatever time it may be. The first way we do that is by admitting our need. Saying, God, I need you. I can't do, I can't fix my life. I can't do life on my own. God himself can't help us till we admit we need help. And so he just waits for us. He waits for us to say, God, I need you. The second is believe. Believe that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you, he did for me. Believe that he did what we can never do for ourselves and believe in that. Believe that he's the ultimate answer for the ultimate needs of your life. And I believe in that. Then commit yourself to following him. Commit yourself to the God who's committed to you. Believe in the God who believes in you. And you commit yourself to him. Now listen carefully. He accepts us as we are, but he doesn't leave us as we are. And if your life doesn't change after you believe in him, I don't mean to offend you, but you didn't believe in him. To believe in him is to follow a different leader from my life. I'm no longer, I'm not the leader. I never could be. Follow the right leader. That's why Jesus said, the beginning and end of being a believer is follow me. So my question is, who are you following? Jesus, I want to follow you. Those are the three ways you and I believe in the God who believes in us. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes and bow your heads with me just for a moment all across this room. And if that's you tonight, I, I want to encourage you, some of you who have never believed in or you need to... You need to, to, to re-up your belief. You need to step up again and reaffirm your belief. And right where you are, just, you can simply pray this prayer. And, 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 and repentance means changing my mind. You might feel something, you might not. It's not a feeling. It's, a, it's, a, it's an action. It's a thought. It's a change. To simply say, God, forgive me of my sin. My sin are the choices of running my own life. Forgive me of trying to be God. I'm not. Forgive me. I believe that what Jesus did when he suffered and died was about me. He didn't die for his sins, he died for mine. And I believe that. I trust that. And then thirdly, I will commit myself to wholeheartedly following your lead. I'll follow your lead in every area of my life. Be the leader of my life. And his word says to as many as believe in him, he gives you the divine power and ability to become sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name. Now, I want you to look up. We're going to move into a time of communion. You'll find the communion elements in the seat caddy right in front of you. And if you're new to Benita Valley, we, we welcome you to be part of this communion time. It's not what we provide for you. You don't have to be a member of this church. It's what God provides for us. And I'm going to lead you in this. We're going to kind of do it step at a time so you don't need to do anything on your own. We're going we're to 
eat the bread in a moment together. We're going to drink from the cup together as a family because really it's all about a family-style meal. And online, you can always push pause and get yourself some juice and bread and crackers, and then you come back and just be part of this family wherever you are. If you pull back the first tab, you come to a piece of bread. Paul writes, it was the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it. Would you break the bread with me? He said, this bread is me. It is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. He, does, he says, remember your brokenness. He says, remember what I did for your broke. You hold in your hands a gift receipt. Now, some of you keep those presents. I, I don't buy my wife presents. I buy her gift receipts, and she takes it back and buys what she always wanted. So, so I just, this is a receipt. It really is. It's a receipt for your healing. It's a receipt for your restoration. It's a receipt for your peace. It's a receipt for divine order of God in your life. So if you need it tonight, it's been paid for. The only thing you can do now is either receive it or reject it. See, if you buy a gift, it's not a gift. You earned it, but gifts you've got to receive. Father, we receive the gift of healing, of hope, of miracles. We receive the gift of your divine synergizing of everything in our life. And I pray for those who need a touch right now, physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, single, seniors, I pray for each one, and I pray wholeness. Jesus came to bring us life, not to take our life. And so I pray for the wholeness of Jesus on this very special, holy, set-apart evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's eat the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. And as freely as we receive this bread, may we now freely say yes to every divine gift needed. The second tab you come to is grape juice. And Paul says he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant. It is a, a promise in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me. What he says to us once again is, God will forgive us. He will cleanse us. He will wash us. He will accept us. One of my favorite stories is of the, the, the young son who took his dad's inheritance and said, Dad, you're not dying fast enough. Give me my inheritance. I want to spend it while I'm still a kid and have fun. And he wastes it all and he spends it all. He has nothing left. And he finds himself in a pig's pen eating the pig's food. And he goes, this is, this is messed up. I'm going to go home because a servant in my dad's house does better than this. And so he starts heading for home. And while he's still a long ways off, his dad sees him, and his dad starts to run down the road. His dad, truthfully, been looking every day since he left. His dad let him go. See, God lets us go because he's not going to, you're not, he's not going to robot control your life. He gave you a will, and you can run if you want to run. He lets you run, but he watches for you. And then he runs toward his son, and in those days, the dads did not run. If they ran, you were in trouble. But he doesn't run to harm him. He doesn't run to beat him. He doesn't run to berate him. If you read the story, the young man starts whipping off his, his, his apology, starts whipping out, I'm, I'm sorry. And his dad says, Rap, put a coat on his back, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, because my son who was lost is found, and he was dead, and he's alive. Jesus said, that's the picture of the Father. See, some of you think, if I come back, God's going to, no, no, no. God can't wait for you to turn your heart toward home. And to as many as do, there is forgiveness and grace and another chance and another chance and another chance. Father, in Jesus' name, all of us have run away. By the calling of your Holy Spirit, may we run to you and experience the forgiveness that only you can give us. No guilt, no condemnation, no judgment because Jesus was condemned and guilted and judged for us. And I thank you for this cup in Jesus' name. Would you drink it with me? Thank you, Father. This Navidad This Navidad This Navidad Thank you.
Feliz Navidad, por espero año y felicidad. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, prospero año y felicidad. Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, Feliz Navidad, prospero año y felicidad. I just wanna say Merry Christmas to ya. Feliz Navidad. I wanna say Merry Christmas to ya. Feliz Navidad. I just wanna say Merry Christmas to ya. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad, prospero año y felicidad. Yes, yes.